Hello, everyone. Welcome to this broadcast, Recognizing Beta-Glucan Impurities in Biopharmaceuticals. I'm Jeannie Linky Northrup, Managing Editor for Pharmaceutical Technology. We are ple pleased to bring you this webcast sponsored by Samsung Biologics. Samsung Biologics is a fully integrated CDMO offering state-of-the-art services with proven regulatory approvals, the largest capacity, and the fastest throughput. Samsung Biologics is an award-winning partner of choice and is uniquely able to support the development and manufacturing of Biologics products at every stage of the process, all while meeting the evolving needs of biopharmaceutical companies worldwide. Before we begin with this broadcast, I have just a few important announcements to make. I'd like to remind our audience that this webcast is designed to be interactive, and so I encourage you to ask questions to our guest presenter throughout the event. You can submit your questions to him by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found at the bottom of the video player. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the small icon in the bottom right corner of your media player. Please note that all slides will advance automatically during the event. If you experience any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the question mark help widget that can be located in the top right of your presentation window. I would now like to introduce Soon Bin Kwan, a senior scientist in the Manufacturing Science and Technology Group with uh, Samsung Biologics. Soon Bin has been with Samsung Biologics since 2019. He obtained his PhD in biotechnology from Yonsei University in Korea. Notably, Soon Bin has extensive experience in downstream processing, including tech transform various scale. Soon Bin, welcome. So glad that you could join us today. Please go ahead and get us started. I'm Soon Bin Kwan from Samsung Biologics, and I'm a senior scientist in MSET with experience in downstream process tech transfer. Today, I'll be presenting recent case studies on how to tackle first positive and the toxin result in downstream process. We will also discuss the impact of beta-glucans on biologics manufacturing and how to mitigate their impact. Just to briefly go through the table of contents, first, I will introduce four key items for better understanding of today's webinar. Beta-glucan and the toxin at AI solution, and how beta-glucans can impact in the toxin testing and biologics manufacturing. Secondly, I will share the unexpected issues we faced recently in endotoxin testing. In this section, I will also present the investigation result and confirm root cause. Last but not least, I will present the non-manufacturing processes to reduce beta-glucans and how we can solve the issues surrounding beta-glucans. Let's start with the introduction. What is beta-glucans? Beta-glucans are polysaccharides composed of D-glucose monomers and originate from cell walls of bacteria, fungi, yeast, and some plants. They have diversity in length and structures in molecular weight varying from 1 kilodalton to 10,000 kilodalton. If you look at the figure on the right, you can see the diverse structure of beta-glucans. Beta-glucans have several hydroxide functional groups, so has partial negative charge. In biomanufacturing processes, cellulose-based raw materials can be used, and these raw materials are the main source of beta-glucans. As an example, that filters are generally used to remove cell debris or aggregates, and these death filters are one major source of beta-glucans in biomanufacturing processes. What is endotoxin? Endotoxin is lipopolysaccharide in the outer membranes of gram-negative bacteria. It has a phosphate group, so has strong negative charge, and they are fever-causing toxin and can also cause an immune response. Too much endotoxin can cause sepsis, so endotoxin levels in biologic should be monitored and controlled under regulatory guidelines. Any product with an endotoxin level beyond the specific limit cannot be released and cannot be used in human and patients. As endotoxin needs to be monitored and controlled properly, every biomanufacturing process includes several endotoxin samples, and the endotoxin level in the 
samples are monitored routinely. For this endotoxin testing, the lemon loss available site, right say, in short, that a solution is widely used. You can see limulose in the figure on the right. The blue liquid is blood of limulose, and a solution is made using this blood of limulose living organism. Adenine solution is not only sensitive to endotoxin, but also can react with beta glucans. However, as it is originate from living organisms, there is a lot, lot of variation in sensitivities of both endotoxin and beta glucans. To be commercialized, the product needs to be properly diluted to have consistent sensitivity on endotoxin. I will discuss how beta glucans have impact on endotoxin testing and biomanufacturing. In this figure, you can see two signal pathways. One starts from endotoxin and the other starts from beta glucans. You can easily catch that. The final reactions of two signaling pathways are the same as a result. Beta glucans can result in a first positive reaction in terms of endotoxin test. Although first positive reactions do not impact patient safety or change the regulatory perspective, they could financially impact manufacturers by causing undue quality record investigations and through product rejections. It may also impact drug supply. So first positive reaction should be prevented. And vendors of area solution suggest using a glucan blocker or endotoxin specific buffer. Endotoxin specific buffer, in short, yes buffer. Thus many drug manufacturers, including Samsung Biologics, uses a glucan blocker if required. Case of Samsung Biologics, we have a qualification process of endotoxin test for each sampling point. In the early phase of manufacturing and during the qualification process, we do studies to decide whether a glucan blocker is required or not for each sampling point. After qualification, we use or don't use glucan blocker or qualification result unless there is process change that may have impact on better glucan level. Now I'd like to share recent case studies. Here is one specific case study. In the table, you can find three groups. Group one are reserved from historical batches. There was no detectable endotoxin, even though endotoxin specific buffer, yes, buffer was not used. Group two and group three are reserved from recent batches. Group two shows similar endotoxin level with group one below detection limit. While this ratio is about tenfold higher in the total levels when the yeast buffer is not used. First of all, to clarify whether it is the first positive reaction or not, the samples were retested with yeast buffer and it confirms that there is no detectable endotoxin. And then we concluded that the result is first positive. As it is confirmed as a first positive reaction, we measured at glucan levels in group two and group three, but there was only a minor difference in the level of beta glucans, and it is insufficient to explain the tenfold increase of the of the first positive reaction. Also, during the investigation, we found that group two used relatively old NAR region, and group three used relatively new region. So we could conclude that. The probable cause of the of the high force pass reaction was the bottle variation of area region, not in inconsistent level of beta glucans. Like the first case, we had similar issues in 13 additional cases. Here are the results from seven additional cases. About 44 higher sensitivity was observed in each graph. The first two parts are results from historical batches. Result under the detection limit is shown in the first bar, and the result above the detection limit is reflected in the second bar. As you can see, there is no second bar, or the second bar is close to the detection limit. However, in recent batches, as shown in the third bar of each graph, there were high endotoxin leisure. However, it was confirmed as first positive reactions, as there was no detectable endotoxin during the retest with yes buffer, as you can see in the fourth bar. We therefore concluded that recent area solutions have higher beta-glucan sensitivity than before. This 
slide shows six additional cases. We can see similar trends as in the previous cases. In the previous section, I explained that AAF solution is not consistent in terms of ethylene sensitivity, and it can have more than 44 variations. Variations can result into repeated first positive reactions, therefore can lead into undue quality record investigations. In some cases, it may result in unnecessary product rejections and drug supply issues. It's a critical to manufacturers financially and may critically impact patients if patients cannot receive a drug on time. Thus, it is important to solve unexpected unexpected first positive reactions. In the final discussion section, I'd like to share non-manufacturing processes to reduce beta-glucans and how to solve this issue cost effectively and efficiently. First, I'd like to share non-manufacturing process to reduce beta-glucans. There are four types of manufacturing processes. However, they are just general approaches and the details should be develop and confirm during the process development phase of each product. The first one is chromatography process. There are diverse chromatography processes such as ion exchange chromatography, hydrophobic interaction chromatography, or affinity chromatography such as proteinate chromatography. Also, there are diversi diversities in process details such as flow rate, bed height, buffer volume, buffer phase, or buffer conductivity. These details may have impact on beta glucan removal, but several studies show that fine pilot modes are usually effective, while flow-through modes are usually not effective. The second one is UFDF process. The UFDF process may be able to reduce beta glucans but also be able to concentrate beta glucans based on membrane force size and molecular weight of beta glucan The third is using positively charged filters. As endotoxin has negative charge, positively charged filters are used to reduce endotoxin. As beta-glucan also has negative charge, the filters can reduce beta-glucans. The last one is implementing pre-used flush if cellulose filters are used. With the pre-used flush, we can reduce the inflow of beta-glucan. In terms of beta-glucan removal effect, means flush volume and flush Buffer metrics are a critical factor. Early phase flush is very effective, but the impact gradually decreases as the flush volume increases. As I explained before, cellulose filters are the main source of beta glucans in biomanufacturing process. So implementation of pre-use flush is very effective to reduce beta glucans. Additionally, some vendors provide cellulose filters in wet heat condition. In this case, removing the stretch buffer is very effective. For reused cellulose filters, such as UFDF membranes, the level of beta glucan will be gradually reduced on subsequent use. In this case, the beta glucan level varies among batches, so it should be considered too. Now, I will explain four solutions to solve this issue. The first one is to remove the inflow of beta glucans. We can avoid using cellulose filters or we can implement specific processes to reduce beta glucans as I showed in the previous slide. However, this approach may not be practical to manufacturing teams as it should be considered from the, from the early process development phase. The second one is using an ES buffer for or endotoxin testing. However, this approach is not cost efficient and could be considered imprudent. The third one is using consistent LAR reagent. If a vendor can produce and provide LAR reagents with consistent sensitivity on both endotoxin and beta glucans, it will be good. However, this is technically an impossible option at the moment. To solve this issue, in vitro culture based LAR reagents have been developed but they are yet to be approved or commercialized. Otherwise, a vendor of a real agent can discard a product if it has high beta glucan sensitivity, but it is financially critical to the vendor. As another option, a user of a real agent can 
take the responsibility or usual measures that there can sense to be or realization before use and uses it only if it meets the predefined specification. However, this is not a practical approach to users. The last one is improving the qualification process. I will explain this in the next slide. In this part, I will share some of the best practices. At Samsung Biologics, during the qualification of endotoxin test for each sampling point, we do studies to decide the requirement of glucan blocker or ES buffer. After qualification of each sampling point, we use or don't use glucan blocker or qualification reserve unless there is process change that may have impact on the beta glucan level. This qualification process is assuming that beta glucan levels are consistent among batches and assuming that LDL regions are consistent in sensitivity on beta glucans. However, the second assumption is not a true statement, as I explained earlier. The, the qualification process should be improved. As improvement of qualification process, first, we should be aware that area regions are not consistent in sensitivity on beta glucans. Second, we should consider whether there are cellular filters or other known sources of beta glucan in the manufacturing process. If any source of beta glucan is used, we should consider using yes buffer in the next step. Last, we should consider whether there is a beta glucan removal process, such as previous filter flush, fine pellet mode of chromatography, or possibly charge filters, and so on. If so, we don't need ES buffer for samples after this process. This is based on a knowledge-based assessment, so it may not be 100% effective, but will be highly effective. If there are any questions regarding the knowledge-based assessment, that the local level monitoring throughout the full manufacturing process can be considered. This is the end of today's webinar. Thanks for your joining and attention. If you have any questions, please ask. Thank you. Sinbin, thank you so much. That was a terrific presentation, very in-depth about um, some topics that are very, very important in today's biotech industry. Uh, excited to jump into our question and answer session next. But before we get started, I'd like to remind our audience how they can submit questions. You can submit questions to Sunbin for response by typing them in the Q&A box Again, this can be found directly below your video player. So soon, Ben, I'm exploring some of the questions that have come in from the audience. And this first question is very, very, very important. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about sterile filters. Can they remove or reduce beta glucans? Thanks for the important question. The answer is no. Uh, as I uh, said during the introduction section, size of beta glucans are diverse and known as between 1 to 10,000 kilodaltron. And this size is smaller than 0.2 micrometer filters for size. And even viral filters cannot remove beta glucans. Then, Ben, how can you explain how binder loop models of chromatography processes are usually effective in reducing beta glucans while? Obviously, flow through modes are not. It's because fine illness modes are developed to capture only the target protein, while closer modes are developed to capture only some impurities. As the probability for beta glucans to be captured in the column is low, in fine illness mode, beta glucans can be removed during the process while target proteins are captured. In flow through mode, Beta glucans can be collected with the target protein while some impurities are captured. Thank you. Another question that I've seen pop up for you soon, Ben, regarding flow through modes of anion exchange. Uh, we know that it's usually effective to reduce endotoxins. Is the process effective to reduce beta glucan too? Uh, it is also a very interesting question, and the answer is it may. Endotoxin is negatively charged, so it can easily be removed 
during AEX process. Beta glucans are also negatively charged, but partially negative. Thus, it may be, but it depends on the pH and conductive or operational conditions. Uh, however, there are only several articles showing that the flow stream model of AEX are not effective to read more beta glucans. Thanks, Sunbin. I know we are starting to run out of time today. I do want to remind our audience that any questions that have come in that Sunbin cannot get to before our presentation ends, uh, he will kindly review and respond to offline. Uh, before we end today's webcast discussion, Sunbin, I have one final question for you. Is there any specific reason for the high sensitivity of the recent LAL reagents that you discussed? It is unclear. Uh, as explained in the introduction section, LAL reagents are produced from the blood of living organisms. Diverse environmental changes can have an impact on living organisms, likewise for LAL reagents, but the exact reason is unknown. Thank you, Soon Ben. So we are about to wrap up today's discussion, but Soon Ben, I wanted to thank you for hopping on. Uh, from across the globe to help present this discussion. I'd also like to thank our audience for their participation today. Uh, and last but not least, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Samsung Biologics, for making today's educational webcast possible. As I mentioned earlier, uh, this topic of beta-glucan and endotoxins is becoming very, very popular uh, amongst discussions in the biopharma industry. So we'd like to ask everyone in the audience if they'd kindly participate in a brief survey. Uh, this survey will appear on your screen after today's presentation has concluded. You'll also receive an email alerting you when this webcast is available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to any colleague who may have missed today's live event. Thank you all for joining. We'll see you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>